excellent talks. So you're in for a real treat. These are all uh, super people. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about them afterwards. In fact, we have two uh, J.B. Rubinsky lectures in the next month. This is the first of all the two. But my job, first of all, is to introduce you to Dr. Sethi Nikerchik. Uh, he was born and educated in uh, the former Soviet Union. He almost completed his uh, Kandidatska, his, his degree in his history. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, and he left. He traveled first to Australia, where he was a uh, researcher, and then uh, he moved uh, to Edmonton in the mid-90s, where he completed his degree in history as a doctoral student at the University of Alberta. After graduating in 2000, he uh, was for a while a visiting uh, fellow at uh, Michigan University, and then eventually he found a permanent teaching position in the University of Victoria. So he comes to us from the University of Victoria. He is uh, well known today because of his books, because of his numerous uh, articles. He's well known as a specialist on Ukraine, Ukrainian history, but in particular on Stalin, the Stalin period, Stalinist period, and even more interesting, on the culture, Stalinist culture in Ukraine uh, in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. His uh, recent book, and the cover of that book is actually on the cover of the poster, analyzed the so-called Russian-Ukrainian friendship that has been inscribed into culture, into history, history books, and into memory. Um, and now he's also published in 2007 another book which deals with uh, Ukrainian history, modern Ukrainian history, the uh, nationalities policy in the Soviet Union, and the formation of a modern Ukrainian identity. The first book, which is uh, which was brought him a great deal of recognition and fame, is Stalin's Empire of Memory. Ukrainian and Russian Relations in the Soviet Historical Imagination. It was published at the University of Toronto Press in 2004, and it can still be found, it can still be bought. Um, the second book is The Birth of the Modern Nation, Ukraine, The Birth of the Modern Nation, in, uh, published in 2007. This uh, last book, uh, which is also now getting a great deal of publicity, is, uh, has been billed as the first Western survey of Ukrainian history to include coverage of the Orange Revolution and, and its aftermath. It narrates the deliberate construction of, of the modern Ukrainian nation, incorporating new scholarship and a lot of archival materials. Uh, so he is one of the people who had one of the new scholars, uh, the younger scholars, who has made extensive uses of the archives. There's been an archival revolution in Ukraine in the 90s, in particular uh, under Yushchenko's term, the archives were opened up and a great uh, amount of new material has become available. One reviewer of this last book said, Yersidhiya Kelchuk has written a modern history of modern Ukraine, one that questions nationalist mythologies and patriotic claims to an uncontested past and shows how making a nation requires the hard work of scholars and poets, soldiers and statements, and even Soviet bureaucrats. This is simply the best history of this new nation that we have. It's been uh, hailed as reliable, accessible, um, and uh, extremely readable, as are all um, Soviet Yukonchik's works. I mentioned that he represents one of the new generation, the younger generation of scholars. And I would have liked to have gotten him in even earlier, because uh, so he has been publishing remarkable things uh, on the cusp of history and culture. Uh, he, he is able to combine these two things. But we're, I'm delighted that we finally have been able to, to bring him in. Uh, today, this new generation of scholars includes not only people of Ukrainian background. In fact, as in many, many disciplines, uh, you, you name it, you know, whether it's Russian or Spanish or, 
or any other. And some of the interesting scholarship is actually produced by people outside, uh, outside the, the culture. So uh, we now have a Ukrainian uh, scholarship, not only people in Ukrainian background, not only people from Ukraine, but a great deal of people from other countries who are enriching uh, uh, the scholarship. They are breaking down the traditional narratives um, and they are finding new ways new, of describing <coughs> Ukrainian history, new methodologies, new approaches. All these people are interested in, in, in great puzzles uh, posed by East European history and East European nation building. And they have really revived uh, uh, an interest in um, uh, the field. So for all these reasons, I'm absolutely delighted to, to welcome Sylvie Mikhaichik. Please give him a warm welcome.
So the obvious conclusion stemming from this point is that there existed a Stalinist Ukrainian culture. That's my first proposal. That Stalinism did not really eliminate Ukrainian culture as such. Rather, it sought, the Stalin regime sought to create a certain type of Ukrainian culture, which would be acceptable, which would be, in fact, very instrumental in molding the Soviet Ukrainian people, in instilling the values of the Soviet Union in the minds of uh, young Ukrainians. Now, of course, that's a difficult proposition. And the difficulty of this proposition is connected to the very composition of the Soviet Union, the very nature of the Soviet regime. Um, the Soviet regime, and here is my second proposition, continued thinking in, an, in ethnic terms. The Soviet Union, in fact, was founded for a good reason as a federation of republics, of which by far the largest and most important industrial and all other respects was the Russian Republic. However, all other cultures as well had government support. So what is happening under Stalin, and this is a big contrast with the 1920s, and Ukrainian culture, in fact, flourished due to this government support because it was not combined with strict censorship and repression. This only starts in the 1930s. So what did this change, this uh, sea change, really, happening in around 1929, 1930, 1932? And this change is very often defined by scholars of culture as provincialization, marginalization of when is pushed out, allowed to exist in teachers' colleges, allowed to exist in the writers' unions and other such pockets, but not in the mainstream, when the newspapers are being switched into the Russian language, the political language, the speeches party bosses give are in Russian, so that's important. The Ukrainian culture is a provincialized, marginalized, pushed out. So I, I have heard this proposal many times, and most recently at the defense of a very good dissertation at some very good university, which will remain anonymous. Um, and then when, when, when she said this, uh, the person defending the thesis said this, it occurred to me that when we usually say Ukrainian culture was marginalized and provincialized, we actually mean something else. That, in fact, if you look at the history of Russian culture at the same time, it too was marginalized and provincialized. Because it was actually undergoing the very same transformation of the Ukrainian culture in the 1920s. All the modernists, all the really important figures, um, being criticized or even killed secretly or arrested. And then, in, in place of this vibrant modernist culture of the 1920s, something else was produced, a culture which is provincialized and marginalized aesthetically or politically, with choirs and dancing companies representing the nation, instead of what was really truly interesting in the 1920s, modernist playwrights, innovative artists. So this was in fact happening in all corners of the Soviet Union. And it was happening in a curious way. Because very often when we think on the surface of things about what Ukrainian culture is, the, stereotypic, the stereotypical Ukrainian dancing companies and uh, folk choirs, they continue to exist. In fact, some of them were created on the Stalin. Uh, perhaps the two most important companies, the most famous ones still existing today, is the, the national companies. In fact, they are designated the academic, which in the Ukrainian uh, parlance means uh, national status and support from the state. Uh, the Veryovka Choir and the Virsky Dancing Company, the two biggest names, the two most famous ones, were actually created in 1937 and 1943, respectively. One, in the middle of the Great Terror, when so many Ukrainian artists and writers were being arrested, there is a folk ensemble created, a colossal one, supported by the state. So with one hand, the state actually eliminated representatives of Ukrainian culture. With the other one, it actually creates this colossal folk company, which will be sent on tours of Eastern Europe as soon as, uh, if, uh, as, soon as the Red Army conquers any particular part of the Eastern Europe. Here is a folk ensemble. To demonstrate the flourishing of the Ukrainian culture. 
Um, it is also actually a myth, a legend very often encountered in um, uh, memoirs that from the start all the Bandura players were arrested. And the way the legend goes that there was a congress of Bandura players, these folk musicians, all of them were invited to the Congress, arrested in the Congress, and executed, and there were no Bandura players at the time. I truly believed in this myth, actually, because you know, this is what I have read. But then, of course, it turns out that when the Soviet army entered Eastern Poland, and, so to speak, reunited Western Ukraine with Eastern Ukraine in the fold of a single Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, the first artistic company sent immediately after the Red Army was uh, a large capella or a company of Bandura players. They just went in immediately because they represented Ukrainian culture. So they were sent in. And after that, a theater was relocated from an industrial city in eastern Ukraine to western Ukraine, which is highly curious kind of thing of it. And that brings me to my next question. Because these Ukrainian lands on the Poland, invaded by the Soviet Union in 1939, did not need to be Ukrainianized at all. They had developed cultural life, the Shevchenko Scientific Society, all kinds of organizations. Except they were under the Polish domination at the time. Um, and that was a political regime which in fact marginalized Ukrainian activists in a big way. Then the Soviet army comes and for some strange reason it needs to bring cultural figures from the East, from the East. Uh, Fascinating memoirs about uh, the leading playwright Alexander Karnyanchuk arriving in Lviv, making his headquarters at the Hotel George, which still stands uh, was there for conference recently, hopefully not in the same room. Uh, receiving the receiving the Ukrainian local Ukrainian writers and trying to sort them out. Like, are you prepared to accept socialist realism or not? So it, there seems to be an interesting thing going on. So they arrive, they look at what is on the ground. There is Ukrainian culture on the ground. There are organizations on the ground, the writers, choirs, everything. And yet they have to import people from the East in order to create a proper version. And this is, of course, the moment which indicates, OK, so here's what the Stalinist regime is doing. It's not actually eradicating Ukrainian culture as such. It is just eradicating the wrong version of Ukrainian. What is the wrong version of Ukrainian That's a difficult one. Oh, you see, in both versions, there will be very same national icons. The Cossacks, Taras Shevchenko and his poetry, believe in the people uh, as the main force of Ukrainian history, where the notion of sovereignty, <coughs> sovereignty belongs with the peasants. So these points are common to Stalinist culture and Ukrainian culture as we inherited it. In the well, there are also differences, and these differences are pretty crucial. One is a, an open-minded attitude to European artistic trends. And I, I'm going to dwell a little bit on this one, because there are so many collections and talks about Ukrainian culture, which include the term European, that it's kind of a little bit overdone by now, I think, but perhaps it's just my feeling. Ukrainian culture is a European culture. Um, well, when you emphasize this, it essentially means you're trying to juxtapose Ukrainian culture to something else. Like, our culture is European, but yours must be not. But of course, uh, the problem with this is that the Stalinist culture, which invaded Western Ukraine in 1939, which was established in Eastern and Central Ukraine in the early 30s, was not particularly uh, non-European either. It was actually European culture too but a different kind of A European culture, uh, I would say 19th century, kind of high-brow bourgeois, high bourgeois taste European culture. That's really what Stalinism was introducing in Ukraine. Because Stalinism is, as in fact, an aesthetic phenomenon as well. It comes with an artistic taste. It comes with a grand style. So every time you travel to a major city in which um, the architectural landscape was changed, um, especially immediately after World War II. You don't know very well what Stalinist architecture is like. It's pretty recognizable, and sometimes it's called very unique architecture. It doesn't really fit with contemporary European trends, 
but it does pretty well with the European trends of the previous century. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough, the same can be said of other genres, other um, areas of Stalinist culture. This is true of Stalinist poetry. It's not a modernist poetry. It's pretty classical, it's uh, didactic, it's narrative, it is very recognizable. It is European for sure, if you want to use the uh, moniker European, but it is not 20th century European in the previous stage. The same actually uh, is true of uh, plays that the Stalinist playwrights are producing. The same is true of Soviet novel, in fact. The didactic novel of education and character making has very clear antecedents in the 19th century. This is precisely the culture which Stalinism is trying to implant, to educate, to develop in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. What they need is essentially people who would play along. And here is my next proposition. How people are sorted out in the late 1920s and early 1930s into those who understand and those who don't understand the new rules of the game. And all of them all of them essentially start out as modernists, except for the new generation of proletarian poets and playwrights who come into literature in the late 1920s. And very often it is actually a party assignment, and that's the exact translation from Ukrainian or Russian, if you wish. Uh, the party assignment to go into literature and write on certain topics in certain style. The rest of them, however, are influenced by modernism, by futurism, by whatever, whatever you, you name it. So these people have to then be taught a lesson, be taught a lesson. And in a sense, what I'm going to argue in my work on Stalinist culture is that lessons are usually taught in an indirect, indirect form. They are not lessons in the form of a person, let's say, being arrested for being a futurist poet or a modernist prose writer. That is very rare. They could be recommended. Um, kind of re-educated, they are arrested for something else, and I'm going to arrive at the point for what actually they get arrested and very often executed. But the signals arrive in the form of usually rather obscure, unsigned editorial in the newspaper Pravda, or sometimes in Kultura Egyptia, Culture and Life, or sometimes in a, a periodical specific to the Ukrainian Republic. These are unsigned <laughs> editorials. They are rather obscure. They never actually say directly what is needed. They indicate what is wrong. Um, for what you know now in the age of the archives about the origins of these ideological signals, uh, the confusion is not really intentional. This is how they receive signals. The signals are very often received from the very top of the Kremlin leadership, from Stalin himself, pretty often and from his closest collaborators such as Zhdanov and Shepakov, who kind of, uh, supervise the cultural scene. Uh, the person who writes it down is very often the editor of Pravda or some other important ideological official who carries a notebook with him. It's always a him. It's a political world in which there are very few women. So this person carries a notebook and every time Stalin goes on rambling about something, this is wrong, I don't like this. Um, immediately it gets written down and then presented in a narrative form as close as possible to the original war, works of the great leader and published in a newspaper. Of course, the beauty of the Stalinist system is that nobody would, uh, would uh, have the nerve to ask for an elaboration. But that's what happens. An article appears, it is an editorial, unsigned, anonymous, which says, there have been mistakes in such and such play. And perhaps a short sentence about what the mistakes actually were. But to elaborate on this article, it's a task of somebody else. It's a task of the people on the ground. And this is where Stalinist culture really starts working. Because even though so Stalin was known uh, you know, to be a voracious reader, and indeed he was trying to read all the major literary magazines as soon as they were published, trying to read all the major novels, strangely enough, and he actually managed to see all the films released in the Soviet Union beginning in the uh, mid-1930s. Each and every movie released in the Soviet Union was only released after Stalin saw it. Um, he was still incapable of covering the entire cultural field. 
only 16 at the time in the province, later 15, but his time 16, um, and in different languages. That was impossible. So he could only actually, you know, the omnipresent, omnipresent dictator could only catch some things. And this is why, by the way, we have a major ideological campaign in Ukraine in 1951, when a um, wonderful lyrical poet, Vladimir Sosura, is being denounced for Ukrainian nationalism for a poem which was published in 1944. And in fact, universally acclaimed as a great poem, in fact, a wonderful collection of poems. He received all kinds of prizes from the state for this collection. He received all kinds of you know, benefits in the apartment in Kiev for promotions, the order of Lenin, the list goes on. Um, but then, the thing is that the poem was in Ukrainian. In 1951, however, it appeared in the Russian translation, in a literary magazine in Russia. And because, as I said, Stalin was trying to read all the major literary journals, he actually you know, tumbled upon this poem. What is that? So, uh, with a delay of seven years, this poem is denounced as a statement of nationalism in Ukrainian literature. Just because, just because, Stalin happened to read it seven years later. This brings me to one of really important points in my research. That the Stalinist version of Ukrainian culture is produced through a symbolic interaction between Stalin himself in person and the artists, writers, writers, musicians. They are supposed in some way to write for Stalin, not for the people, but actually for Stalin. Stalin is the supreme leader as well. Um, Stalin, the supreme censor, he's the only one. How, how does he even manage? Um, and not just that, but they are supposed to be inspired by him and only him. Not any Republican leaders. By the way, you don't get this about Khrushchev, and Khrushchev is party boss in Ukraine. You do not get poems devoted to him. Uh, there is no adulation on the same stage. So what is supposed to inspire Stalinist writers? composers and artists as the direct interaction with Stalin. Now, well, the direct interaction with Stalin is impossible. Can he possibly receive all the thousands of Ukrainian writers and artists? He can only receive the select few, no matter what his intentions are, to inspire them, to tell them how to write, perhaps to criticize them, to order them arrested and executed, whichever his purpose is. He can only possibly manage with perhaps a hundred or so. So, as I said, here the mechanism of signals comes into play. An article shows up in the newspaper about the writer such and such committing mistakes. This is how it is communicated to the rest. Now, this about this, uh, I want to stay just a second longer on this uh, symbolic personal interaction with Stalin because it is pretty significant. It is enforced through um, random, random incidents. Yeah. I better write it down before I start writing introduction to the book and then I wouldn't remember. Okay. Um, um, it falls through random incidents. So what happens? Uh, Volodymyr Sosura, the lyrical poet, who I, I just said was denounced seven years later for the poem, right? Um, before that, in the 1930s, um, his wife was arrested as the enemy of the people. Randomly, essentially, as so many people were arrested in the 1930s. And Sosura, who had a history of mental uh, disorders, ended up in a mental asylum where he was treated. Um, and as he was being treated in a mental hospital at this institution, he wrote a letter to Stalin from there. So it was possible, you know, from a mental asylum to write a letter to Stalin. And this letter opened with the now famous phrase, the letter has been reproduced in Sosura's own memoir, and the, the uh, address, the form of address was telling. Uh, dear Father, save me. That's how Sosura addressed Stalin in his letter in Ukraine. So uh, the letter was apparently delivered to Moscow, and as a result, very soon, an order followed from Moscow to release the poet Sosura from the mental hospital, award him the Lenin Medal, and give him an apartment. How? Oh, this. Here, here is what I mean by you know, being enforced by random incidents or random accidents. So obviously this was not published in newspapers. 
but the rumors spread all across the cultural be careful here. Uh, all across the cultural field. Here, you see Sasura, his wife was arrested, he was in the mental hospital. He wrote to Stalin, and here we go. Released from the hospital, all dressed up in a beautiful suit, the order of Lenin and his girl, and a new apartment. So here's the best example. It doesn't really matter. Stalin couldn't read all the letters from all the poets from all mental hospitals, I assume, right? <laughs> so he read a couple of them, but everybody knew. And this is how the system operated. And there are numerous examples of this in Ukrainian culture. Perhaps some of you know a, a great Ukrainian singer, Boris Gmira. Boris Gmira, no, no. streets named after him, it's a beautiful bass baritone, bass baritone, uh, famous opera singer from the uh, 1930s to 1960s, he died in the 1960s. Well, uh, there was a major interruption in his career because he didn't leave Kyiv. He actually stayed in Kyiv under the German occupation because his wife was sick. He couldn't abandon his wife, actually. Um, and that was a major no-no in uh, artistic world of Stalinism. So you stayed on, you wanted to remain under the German occupation, there might be something wrong with you. So therefore, his career, his career didn't move uh, along as fast as it was supposed to, because he was a major star on an opera scene, a beautiful voice. And now, of course, there are numerous recordings of him all around the internet, if you wish. In you know, you can buy discs, it's on YouTube, or is it media. Well, he had a problem. Uh, he couldn't advance through the system of these honorific titles, because, of course, Stalinism wanted to have a system of honorific titles, like it had in the army, it had the same in the artistic world, it could be, um, you know, an on, on, honorary <coughs> artist of the Republic, people's artist of the Republic, and people's artist of the Soviet Union, which was the best, and also gave you the best conditions when you could go on tour, so your pay would be much better. So the problem with Mira was, he was a wonderful singer, just beautiful words, uh, performed everything, a Western European opera, Ukrainian songs, he was just good at everything. Absolutely good, great actor as well. Problem is, uh, he stayed in Kiev under the German occupation. He sang at the Opera Theater in Kiev. Actually, the Opera Theater was open under the German occupation. Um, also, the, uh, most of the best seats were reserved only for the German officers. In fact, the Soviets bombed the Opera Theater. And the bomb uh, fell in the orchestra pit and did not explode. So, it's quite a big story at the time in Kiev. But what leads me to the story of the fate of Gmeyer? So after the war, everybody knows he's the best, that he's the best. But he is only an, honor, um, an honorary artist of the Republic. He's like the lower, lower ranks of artistic hierarchy. But he's the best. So when they go to Moscow to present the achievements of Soviet culture, Soviet Ukrainian culture, this is done pretty regularly, actually, beginning in the 1930s. In 1951, there is a colossal delegation of Ukrainian artists, artists, whatever uh, companies going to Moscow. Uh, at the Bolshoi Theater, in the presence of Stalin and all members of the Politburo, they perform the official version of Stalinist Ukrainian culture. And there, of course, things for his mirror, because who else? He's the best. And then, after, after this uh, wonderful event, after this festival of Soviet Ukrainian culture in the Kremlin uh, and in the Bolshevik theater, a government decree is published that such and such people are from now on designated as people's artists of the Soviet Union or honor honorary artists of the uh, Republic or people's artists of the Republic. And then, when this decree was prepared, Stalin actually made one tiny little correction on it. So, Amir was supposed to go up one step People's Artist of Ukraine, and Stalin crossed out Ukrainian and wrote the Soviet Union. So he pushed him through this step in the artistic hierarchy just because he liked the voice. And then Stalin died, and his collection of recordings was discovered, and it turns out that he was doing with recordings the same thing he was doing with everything, including the uh, list of people to be arrested and executed. He was using a thick blue or secret pencil and putting check marks where he saw check marks below. And it turned out that all the recordings of Boris Mary, all the Ukrainian folk songs, were marked with like a secret check mark, meaning he's good. He's really good. And he was named People's Artist of the Soviet Union. And of course, what is important in this event is that it acquires mythical qualities, legendary qualities. People talk about it. Have you heard about Mary? He was under the Germans. 
he should not have been made the people's artist, but Stalin himself. Like. And here, it's not really about any, um, let's see, institution. Okay, I better attend. Okay. It's not about any insti institutional functioning of Stalinist culture, because you see, if the institutional channels, then it should be processed according to institutional channels. But that would not be Stalinist culture. That would be too democratic for Stalinist culture. Stalinist culture has to present the mystique. There has to be a good Tsar over there in the Kremlin, who is benevolent at some times and not so much at the others. But he can be benevolent, right? And so this is what happens to Gliria, this is what happens to Sessur, and yet somebody else, somebody else is getting arrested and perhaps executed too. And let me actually um, from here proceed to two things. Um, one is how it would function ideally institutionally, and secondly to people who get arrested and executed. Oh no, actually, let me reverse myself. First to the people who get arrested and executed, second to how it would have functioned institutionally. And now, um, what um, the defining feature I said of Stalinist culture and certain randomness of interactions, because they cannot really control cultural expression, so they control it by example, by this random happenings, uh, by legend and the mystique of Stalin interfering here and there, by interpretation which is left to local bureaucrats, and local bureaucrats are very often also writers, so they're kind of wearing two hats, which brings me to a number of interesting ideas about Stalinist culture. For instance, the chief censor in Ukraine, the chief censor, the head of censorship apparatus in Ukraine under Stalin, for almost all of the Stalin period, is actually a Ukrainian playwright specializing in light comedy. What does he tell you about Stalinist censorship? How can you, with one hand, you know, compose light comedy and the other say, oh, that's not serious enough, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not published. So these people, in fact, censor themselves, and in a curious way, too. Um, but secondly, um, okay, so those who did um, get arrested and executed, Usually, not for the reason of being writers. Actually, the very few people uh, who, when presented with a formal view of whatever you call it, uh, indictment bill, uh, it actually included any of writing or artistic activity. Usually, usually, these were the people who were arrested as, of all kinds, Russian monarchists or Polish nationalists, and actually Polish nationalists predominating by far. The overwhelming majority of Ukrainian writers arrested and executed under Stalin were arrested and executed as members of the Polish military organization, which at the time did not exist, perhaps existed in the earlier period. It was an entirely fictitious organization. And the reason why Ukrainian writers should have joined it is quite obscure because they were actually ideologically opposed to the concept of greater Poland. They were developing Ukrainian culture. That's the kind of two different things. But logic did not matter in Stalinist arrests. And the earlier ones, the earlier ones, those arrested in 1933-34, were usually arrested in connection with the murder of Sergei Kirov in, in the city of Leningrad. And that campaign primarily targeted Russian monarchists. For some reason, a number of Ukrainian writers, including perhaps the most famous of them is Grigory Kosinka, ended up being arrested for Russian monarchism in connection with the Kirov murder. They had nothing to do with Russian monarchism, nothing to do with with Kirov murder, and yet they were arrested. That, of course, brings me to, to the point that these arrests are in the same way as cultural endorsements. In the very same way, the arrests and persecution were random, too. They were meant to teach a lesson, usually, more than uh, kind of to target specific people. Well, if, 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 if all the modernists were killed, why Petritsky survived? If all of the poetic school people were arrested, why did Dovzhenko survive? But if all new classics were executed, why Rizky became the Stalin, uh, Stalin Prize winner five times over? There is no logic. So uh, it was not guided by aesthetic 
uh, criteria connected to literary trends or even to the enforcement of socialist realism. Also, there was an important consideration. These people should have, they should be open to accepting the orthodox, the logic of socialist realism, this naturalistic didactic style. But nevertheless, there was a clear randomness present. <coughs> um, and then um, the executions and arrests actually mostly happened in the 1930s. And in a sense, in a sense, um, they served as a powerful factor of fear for Ukrainian cultural figures. Those of them criticized, and then numerous examples of major filmmakers and writers being criticized by Stalin himself openly, in public, being denounced. None of them, in fact, ended up in prison or executed. There was a tiny footnote to that. Some Jewish writers in Ukraine were executed in the late 1940s and members of the alleged Zionist organization in Ukraine. But Ukrainian writers, you can't find them. And there are examples, too. Um, Dovzhenko, most famously, is criticized by Stalin in Moscow, in the Kremlin, in 1944, at a meeting of the Politburo, the highest body of the Communist Party. All of them sitting around the table. Stalin walking, as always, around the table, smoking his pipe, and gives a speech about Dovzhenko making all these terrible mistakes, substituting the Marxist notion of class for that of a nation, making bourgeois nationalist mistakes, that his work is wrong, and then there are some Ukrainian writers who are invited to attend, but forbidden to publish anything about it. That's another confirmation of my kind of subtle signal theory. So there are people there who would know and talk about it, but they are not allowed to write about sitting there at a Politburo meeting in Stalin's presence. Stalin denounces Dovzhenko. Dovzhenko is almost having a heart attack, saying, well, I'm going to get arrested in five minutes, flat. I'm going to get, to get shot on my exit from the room. Well, nothing like that, of course, happened. Because this is not the point. The point is to teach the lesson. What they do to Dovzhenko, as well known, they just transfer him to Moscow and allow him to work at the Moscow film studios, where he's not been particularly productive for a variety of reasons, perhaps because he, he was missing Ukraine so much. Also, it's more complex than that, actually. He had major conflicts at the key film studio as well. Uh, but perhaps also because Soviet film industry was not producing too many movies during the period, so it was not exceptional that he didn't produce much. Like, all, each and every Soviet major filmmaker did not produce much in the late 1940s and early 50s. And yet Dovzhenko survived. He lived to see Stalin's death. He lived to publish a very interesting article in 1954 about artistic freedom. So he survived. So the lesson was important. His individual fate was not. There are a number of uh, similar examples in all areas, if, if you look at the art. So it seems, it seems that the point is not to physically eliminate these people. The point is to send signals which would be understood and would actually produce a new culture, a Ukrainian Stalinist culture. Now, I, I promise to go back at some point to the institution of uh, Professor Shkandri, which probably starts sending me signals at some point. I'm going over my limit. Because usually, you know, my students just start gathering things, which I think <laughs> <laughs> the my lecture is approaching the end, so I better hurry up to the department meeting, whatever it is. Um, so I promise to talk a bit about the institutional procedure in Stalinist culture. That's actually a very interesting topic. Because, okay, I said it was kind of mystical, mythical qualities, um, linked to a large degree to interaction, uh, real or imagined interaction with Stalin himself writing to Stalin, for Stalin, trying to read signals from Stalin. But of course, there was also an institutional context, an important one. There were, you know, the Ministry of Culture, which was actually called in Stalin's time the Committee on Cultural and Educational Institutions, and then renamed the Ministry in 1932. Uh, so they were supposed to manage culture. There was also perhaps the most powerful instrument of ranking artists and writers and composers and sending a signal to them what is good what is accepted, what is desirable, what we would like to have more of. And that was the Committee on Stalin Prizes. Ah. I have to restrain myself from making a comment about the Committee on Shevchenko Prizes in present day <laughs> because I said I'm going to arrive at this toward the end of my lecture. So there has to be an institution which decides who is the best. This has to be a state institution 
has to reflect the present day state policies. Um, and that's a deeply ingrained understanding which can be traced back to Stalin Prizes Committee. But however, you know, you go to the archives, you start looking at it, how exactly were people selected to become Stalin laureates? Well, that's a curious one. They were actually nominated at the local level by writers' unions in the provinces. Then all these nominations go to the republic. At the republic level, they self-select. Is good enough? Oh, she's maybe not. Okay, so these candidates go up. The standard procedure in, in the process of the self-selection, what arrived at Stalin desk in, in, in Moscow, and there was actually a committee of really, really big names, yes, in the major Soviet writers and authors, some of the Ukrainians as well, um, would already be a list which, even before Stalin looked at the list, included the pre-approved products of Stalinist culture. Also, at the local level, you can get all kinds of interesting nominations. For instance, um, you know, when I lecture in Ukraine, I often ask them to guess who was the most popular writer in Ukraine on the start. And that's a tough one. I'm not going to try it on you. I'm just going to give you the answer. Uh, the humorist of Star Fushner, like by far the most popular, not not the author of some didactic industrial novels. Or, I mean, these novels were promoted by the state, published in colossal print runs. People didn't particularly care about reading them. However, the person who could fill rooms was a humorist or star Krishna, who, in fact, spent much of the 1930s um, in the Gulag and was released specifically in 1943 on Khrushchev's request, because when the Soviet um, army comes back into Ukraine in 1943, they arrive in Kiev and Khrushchev says, oh, do we have any Ukrainian culture on the ground? Let me take a look. And then there's some flunky running around with a list. Comrade Khrushchev, here's a have a list. Have a list. There used to be Ukrainian culture here. Here's the list. They take a look at the list. It's a very long list of people um, who got arrested in the 1930s and they actually request to check who is still alive and there are something like six or seven lucky souls who end up being um, um, pardoned, I guess. You know, essentially taken from the gulag and brought back to Kiev and told, well, you know, we are kind of thin on this Ukrainian culture side because of after the German occupation, some people escaped to, to Germany or whatever, and the up in Canada, we don't know. So they didn't like the Stalinist regime. So we need people who like Stalinist regime. So where do we look for them? In the Gulag. <laughs> but some from the Gulag brought to Kiev, and by far the most famous of them, actually two literary scholars, um, is the one artist. Um, this list, it's actually in the archive. But by far the most famous of them is Ostap Vishnu. He comes back and becomes the official humorist. And that, too, is probably undermining an important stereotype of all Stalinist culture, that it would have an official Perhaps the closest you could come in Stalinist culture to our concept of a stand-up comedian. Of course, today for you know, Jay Leno, David Letterman, uh, other people write texts for them. In Stalin's time, that would be one profession. You write the sketches, you read them, you become popular. And there is no television yet, right? So this is how Ostap Vishnu, who kind of politically a very questionable figure, was imprisoned twice, there are all kinds of issues. I mean, he should be in the Gulag, really. No, but we need him. He is the most popular. He is the most popular. So he could be nominated. He could, and he was actually nominated. And sometimes he would make it through the first two selection rounds. And then at some, some, at some level they would say, no, Vishnu is not acceptable. He's not serious enough. Now we know he's by far the most popular, so we're going to keep him. Uh, actually, when he died in 1956, that was one of the most impressive funerals in Kiev in the 1950s. A colossal mass of people, the most popular. Um, but uh, I think I'm getting distracted from my institutional context, which I have written here. Um, the institutional context is such that um, all these nominations arrive, and then, you know, Comrade Stalin, as usual, all these people sitting around the table, Comrade Stalin is walking around, puffing on his pipe, as always, and then sometimes making an obscure, whimsical comment, which then everybody is going to struggle to interpret. What did he mean? <laughs> Am I going to get arrested when I have to do it? <laughs> Well, and then um, turns out that some people, of course, live long lives. Some writers, you know, live very long lives and live memoirs about what is going on in the room. One of them is a famous Russian writer, Konstantin Simonov, who is a 
well-known in Stalin's time as a poet, later on primarily as a prose writer kind of, of novels about World War II, he left a very interesting memoir about being a member of the Stalin Prizes Committee. And one part of his memoir uh, relates to Ukrainian culture in that uh, when Stalin looks at the lists, he sometimes would actually say, well, there's something missing. One very famous occasion when he said that something was missing actually relates to a uh, Russian language writer from Ukraine, later famous dissident Viktor Nekrasov, person from Kyiv, who wrote a novel about the Battle of Stalingrad, which was not on the list, but Stalin said, I'm going to you know, make a suggestion, comrades. There's a great novel about Stalingrad. Of course, comrades, of course, it's a great novel. Uh, however, Simonov describes another occasion, and it's a telling one. When you know, they're discussing the list, Stalin is walking around the room, at some point, perfect his process. What do you think, comrades, about Wanda Vasilevska as a writer? Wanda Vasilevska is originally a Polish writer living in Ukraine, considered a representative of Soviet Ukrainian culture. And there's silence. And then somebody is bold enough to say, Comrade Stalin, she's not a very good writer. And Stalin says, Oh, well, well so be it. Then he keeps walking around the room. And here the matter of interpretation of what it is. Oh, so you cannot jump to Stalin if you feel that you have the entire field behind you, like that none of the profession would actually claim that she is the best writer, or at least a good writer who deserves a Stalin Prize. And what it tells to us is that Stalin Prize is essentially seen by these people in an institutional context as a professional recognition. And it is particularly clear when Stalin Prizes are awarded for music. The composers seem to be more, a little bit more autonomous from the rest of it, because they have special training, they have this recognition of what talent is, uh, and that's the reason why people like Shostakovich or Prokofiev can get criticized a lot. And yet, they're always elected to, to the executive of the Composers' Union, because they are the biggest names. Everybody recognizes they are the most talented ones. And they produce better work. And what it tells us, too, that this criterion, or criteria, are not entirely absent in Stalinist culture. They are present. There is a professional opinion, actually, which could be manipulated by, oh, well, Nekrasov. Oh, Nekrasov is good. He's young. Oh, sure. If you want to give him Stalin Prize second class, we don't mind. Let's give him second class. But Van Dolcelevska, it would be difficult to justify for us as professionals, no matter how much we like the suggestion comments Stalin, she's not a good writer. So, what it tells us is that there is an institutional uh, system which is supposed to work in certain ways their channels, and this can be at any moment be over over written kind of by Stalin's whim. But he would not always insist. So in some cases he would insist because it's important to create a precedent, a symbolic yeah. moment. In others he would, he would just try a suggestion. If it doesn't work, well, not too bad it doesn't work. That's okay. Well, let's approve all other candidates. And that brings me to yet another point, which is the opposite of the institutional structure of Stalinist culture. And namely, the popular component of it. Because we would often assume, we would often assume that the Stalinist state did not particularly care about popular preferences, about the popular taste. That the Stalinist state actually imposed certain kinds of cultural products which people were supposed to consume, and they had no choice. But upon closer consideration, when looking at the archives and reading the memoirs from the time, this turns out to be a total fiction. And for more than one reason. One reason is that the Soviet cultural product was never the only one, except for a short period in the late 1930s. Actually, the Soviet Union was importing Western films, Western movies, until 1932. And between 1932 and the mid-40s, there were only Soviet films available for consumption. And actually, it also had implications in other um, areas of culture, including interest in fashions, the way people dressed. I read a very interesting memoir uh, saying that there was a sea change during the war uh, when we caught up with the European, again, European fashions. And women started dressing up the same way as in Europe because the army came back with all the new clothes. 
So it was kind of reintroduced, the Western mass culture reintroduced. In the very same way it was reintroduced in cinema. Because it turns out that the start of the Soviet Union, which was prosecuting filmmakers, inviting Dovzhenko to the Kremlin to give him a dressing gown for two hours, and going into all this extreme to create the politically correct, the ideologically sound cinema, was in fact importing movies from the West, actually stealing the movies, I have to say, you know, with all these considerations of copyright dominating university libraries these days, and my life as an instructor, and what you can use, what you cannot use. The Soviet Union, of course, did not recognize copyright until 1972. Uh, however, what they did upon, um, upon uh, entering uh, Nazi Germany is they actually grabbed the copies of the movies available in Germany. They also grabbed the facilities and the film uh, quality, color film. That's why after the war you have some of these color movies. But they were most interested, actually, in Western films. In Western films. And by far the popular film after the war in Soviet Ukraine was the Tarzan. And I'm not kidding. This is, in fact, not, not, not any study is politically correct, but the Tarzan. And all the kids were playing in Tarzan and Jane and whatever, just all around the place. It was overwhelming. I don't know how to even phrase it in my future book, but the Disneyization of Stalinist culture. <laughs> so they actually, and not just that, they imported the, the Grand Balls, they import a number of Austrian, German, American films. Actually, American films, which are used totally illegally in the Soviet Union, but they just captured copies in Nazi Germany. And started showing them. Because it turns out that actually there's a concept of profitability in Stalinist culture. There is. We would assume there isn't, but there is actually. And people buy tickets to these movies. So cinemas are producing revenue. And the so-called palaces of culture, which existed at every major factory, sometimes we would assume, and that was actually my research proposal when I started working on this project, I wrote something very smart about the palaces of culture being the sites of discursive interaction between Stalinist blah, blah, blah. And then I went to the archive and discovered nothing of the kind. They were actually showing movies around the clock trying to make money. That's, that's what was going on in the palaces of culture, the, the so-called palaces of Soviet culture. They're showing the movies. And in the evening, dances. Dances. Where you pay, you, you enter the disco. Stalinist disco, that's another chapter type like that. OK, so uh, it's, uh, what, what emerges here is Actually, it's the same as literature, too, as you realize. Or Stav Vishnu is the one who has the highest, uh, uh, the highest honorarium in, 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 in the entire Soviet Union, perhaps. Uh, he sells the greatest number of books. So there could be writers who write industrial novels or novels about the happy life on a Stalinist collective farm. And they're quite OK. They are all right. But they are not genuinely popular. And you know very well when a writer is genuinely popular, such a concept exists in Stalinist. And it's true in space, in cinema, and theater as well. What am I doing in time? And I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to go for how many minutes? Oh, sure. Fine. Uh, uh, it's true in space and the theater. I'm getting confusing. That's stunning, I think. I'm getting confusing signals of what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. If I get arrested after I get the room, then I made the wrong choice. <laughs> if I made the wrong choice, I get the stunning <laughs> Okay. The two in space in the theater, because, uh, of course, you can have a committee uh, uh, and, uh, which, which has a status of the ministry. You can have competitions to produce the best Soviet play. You can have all kinds of ideological decrees. But if people don't buy the tickets, they just don't buy the tickets, period. All the measures you can take, you can force all the school children to attend such and such play. Well, that's not going to work out. They only attend it once on that. Then you have, you know, the whole is half empty. And what do you do? And this is true in particular of, uh, of, of uh, musical comedy and comedy in general, because one thing which amazed me at the archive was the same as Ostap Vishnu, uh, being by far the most popular writer, I discovered that what dominated the theatrical repertoire in Ukraine under Stalin was in fact 19th century comedy of morals. 
the one which the modernists rebelled against. Things like Schellmenko Dinschik, Schellmenko the Orderly, I guess, the kind of thing. 19th century comedies about, about the funny, dancing Ukrainians that are cheerful, kind of starting to strange and with a tendency to steal things. And but always funny. And these 19th century comedies, uh, which Ukrainian culture rejected in the early 20th century as outdated as producing the kind of uh, wrong image of what Ukraine is all about, the little Russian comedies, they came back, came back big time. And they in fact dominated in particular provincial theater scene. And it, it seems that, uh, that the authorities didn't like it either. The authorities didn't like it. They actually wanted more industrial relations is about this Takanovite worker fulfilling and over fulfilling the norm, about the collective farm, kind of modern Soviet child subject. The ideological decrees against historical subjects, modern Soviet subjects are promoted. Yet the public taste, especially in the provinces, uh, really, uh, remains at pretty much the same level as in the late Tsarist times. Kind of funny little Russians dancing. And that they tolerate it. They don't like it, but they tolerate it. Would have preferred conscientious workers dominating the scene. That's not going to work out. And here, of course, a very interesting, uh, from an ideological point of view, phenomenon. And under Stalin, you have this survivals of late Stalinist, ideologically safe Ukrainian culture in the countryside, which they tend to ignore. Because when you read the newspapers, it's all about the workers and collective farmers, and this is what the Soviet place should be all about. Uh, and, yet, and yet, the popular taste is something else. And the big problem, of course, the colossal problem for the Stalinist state is that theaters are all on a subsidy, on a state subsidy. And when you start looking at the archival documents, at the level of the Kremlin, the level of Stalin himself and his you know, immediate ideological advisors, it's all about ideology. But at slightly lower level, it's all about funding. Yeah, funding. Because each and every theater company Relies, uh, it relies on, on a state subsidy. These are calculated every year, and there's a cause of pressure on them to lower the amount of subsidy, to produce plays which would attract or musical comedies or operas, whichever, which would attract more genuine interest from the viewers, from the audience, and yet at the same time would be appropriately Soviet. That is pretty much impossible, very, very difficult especially in the provincial centers. In the capital, perhaps, you have a closer audience of uh, kind of young people who went through consumer schooling in the Soviet time. Uh, they internalized ideology to a greater degree. And yet, they too want to be entertained. They too are the friends of Tazman and Germany. So here is a, a tension, and a rather unexpected one, definitely not the one I expected to find in Stalinist culture, a tension between the popular taste and ideology, a tension between the need to be appropriately Soviet and the need to you know, get rid of, of the subsidy. So there's a lot going on at the core there, which uh, has a sobering effect on my earlier comments about the symbolic interaction. And you can symbolically interact with Stalin you know, a number of times, but still that would not necessarily make you a popular writer. So I guess one of the concluding points, and I say carefully, I'm not quite sure how many concluding points I can possibly have in this lecture. Uh, one of the main concluding points would be that this seems to be this three-way interaction really. So there is time that there are the producers of culture, all these writers and artists who are supposed to write for him, and yet at the same time keeping an eye on the audiences would they buy the product. Because you know you can produce an ideologically correct opera, and actually I'm writing an article about one such opera for the young god. Well, the Soviet partisans during World War II, which is an impeccable Soviet opera, except it's a really bad opera, really bad music, disastrous. Okay, fine, you can force people to go and attend, all the school children have to attend, all the students have to attend. Well, some of the workers, you cannot really force the workers, that's not how it works in Stalinist culture. No, no way, workers would not go. There are limits you know, to how much you can force people to participate in the culture. Which, you know, I'm not getting paid on time, but who are you anyway? <laughs> and that's pretty much what is going on in industrial enterprises. There's a limit. Oh, we are not going to the dormitories, because at the dormitories are just going to say, you know, to help you, and don't care about culture. There are actually limits, and it's very interesting to how 
to, 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 to what degree you can force people to participate in Stalinist culture and, until you reach the point in which they say, no. And they know they can get away with it. They can. Uh, and so this opera, opera is uh, kind of collecting good reviews for a year or two, staged by a number of theaters, uh, with poor reception by the audience, uh, the theater is half empty. Two years down the road, the theater doesn't want to stage it. Because you know what? The theater is receiving memos uh, all the time about the subsidy. So here we are, impeccable opera, approved by Stalin and Khrushchev, whoever, which, however, cannot possibly have a long uh, performative life because it's a bad opera. And people just don't go. So this is the three-way interaction I have in mind, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly how it works. Because, of course, the authorities, if they really want, they can override it. You know, they can, they can, if they wanted to, order people arrested, order everybody to attend this or that. But they would not do it. They would not do it. It would not be productive. And it's not even necessary. They operate by sending signals. Um, so this uh, three-way interaction, which violates the rules of institutional interaction, which are present, which operates very often by enforcement of uh, kind of incidental encounter, incidental encounters, encounters um, which is based on the Stalin mystique, uh, the all-knowing, on my, my science, on my present leader, is in fact a compromise of sorts. Uh, it's a difficult compromise in which all three sides feel that this is not exactly what I want. I would have prepared Tartarzan all the time, or I would have prepared industrial novels all the time, and I would have prepared, preferred that you know I can produce modernist plays about Ukraine because I'm really a modernist at heart. I'm you know from the 1920s, but all of them, all of them, all of them are playing along, they're kind of feeling the limits of possible as cohabitation, coexistence, symbiosis, which really produces Stalinist culture in Ukraine. And my final, final point at this point. Um, <laughs> you don't really realize how much of it is surviving today. This whole concept that the Reichab should play a major role and advise a senior. The concept that the state should decide on which product is good. And there should be a special committee or ministry better yet. And there should be state prizes which should go to the most politically correct and ideologically sound works as determined by whichever is the current government. And any violation of this problem is seen as a, you know, well, that's not right. So when they say that's not right, the model which is right you know, mentally for them is the Soviet model established by Stalin, and I'm going to stop here. Thank you. studies. Um, I would like to thank you for that excellent lecture. You can tell that um, we're getting all sorts of new perspectives, nuanced interpretation, and um, that, that uh, what the things that we're going to learn uh, about um, Stalinist culture and, and the Stalinist period are, are going to be uh, completely overturned by, by what is uh, what our presenter has, has found um, in his, his research. Um, so I think uh, I'm just going to hand it over to uh, Miroslav, and he's going to talk about uh, the upcoming lectures uh, very quickly, and then um, maybe we can take some uh, questions. I forgot to say at the beginning that uh, uh, my name is Miroslav Shkudri, and I represent uh, the Department of German and Slavic Studies, which is one of the organize one of the three organizers of these annual lectures. The other two are the uh, archives and special collections, which Sasha Sweeney represents here today, um, uh, and uh, also uh, the light. So um, I want to well. So he gets his breath back and prepares himself for a question and answer period. I will just mention a couple of things that are happening. We have on the 29th, at the end of uh, March, we have a second uh, J.G. Rubinsky lecturer, and that will be um, Timothy Schneider, the author of Bloodlands, and that actually will be the title of his talk. 
Chucky Snyder, as you probably know, is a very big name now because of that book, and also because of other books that he's written. Uh, we invite you to uh, keep an eye out for the advertisements, and that will be uh, on the 29th, and it will be held in the Mood Court. It will be held in Mood Court at the Law Department at 7 p.m. Uh, we also, we, I should also tell you that uh, a very important journalist uh, and thinker uh, uh, on right on contemporary events, uh, Nicola Diakchuk, will be appearing uh, as well on uh, March the 12th here. And I should say that our very own Yelena Barabán will be speaking on next Wednesday, 15th of February, uh, at uh, 2.30 in the Institute for the Humanities at 419. She'll be speaking about filming a Stalinist epic, Stalinist war epic in Ukraine, Ivo Savchenko's The Third Strike. That's next Wednesday. There will be, uh, these leaflets will be available so if you want to pick up a leaflet about the next two weeks talk, you're welcome to do so. Uh, finally, I should also say that, uh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, Professor Yukanchek's books are available. You can pick them up, you can buy them here, or you can buy them in the bookstore. Uh, so if you're interested in you can get a book signed by the author himself, if you should so desire. I'm sure that Sidney would be happy to uh, speak to you and to get to sign book. And I'm sure you have lots of things to, to say and lots of questions to ask. And now that so he has had a little, little time to recover, uh, he will be prepared to answer questions. Please ask questions. Tutors come to him to teach him economic theory. 
And that fact was uh, kept secret. Oh, I'm sure I, uh, the library here is going to have multiple copies of Stalin's book on the economic problems of socialism in, in the USSR. It's available on the internet. Yeah. Most of Stalin's works are on the internet these days. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, thanks. Um, well, thank you very much for your uh, interesting talk, first of all. I uh, learned a lot. Um, I, uh, uh, Miroslav has rather piqued my curiosity about myths and legends and perceptions around national identity. And I was intrigued by your uh, example of the Bandura players, uh, that, uh, that, that there was this uh, widespread uh, perception that all the Bandura players were killed. Uh, where, where would that uh, perception have originated? I think it probably comes from a memoir, and it probably comes from a newspaper article published in the 40s somewhere, um, either in the German occupation zone or uh, in, in the PP camps at some point, an article which was impressionistic. The, the person in question, uh, I really don't know much, but this is, this is, this is the extent of what I know. Uh, the person probably knew about cases, and there were indeed such cases of the Bermuda players getting arrested. They actually documented in a recent interesting book by a historian from Indiana University. And some did get arrested, but kind of randomly, because they were connected to their own people in Soviet Ukrainian leadership. The chief of culture, Comrade Khvilia, got arrested. So whoever he promoted, all of them got arrested as well. Not because they were involved in some kind of wrong Ukrainian culture, but because they were close to Comrade Khvilia, who supervised the arts within the Ukrainian Central Committee. Um, but uh, I think it also, myth and legends function well when they answer, when they resonate with important previously held notions, and the notions which instinctively appear correct. So this notion would instinctively appear kind of truthful that yes, Stalin regime kind of eradicated this most important component of Ukrainian culture. Whereas in fact you can just look at the Stalinist newspapers, you will get pictures of Mandura players sitting under the portrait of Stalin. Happy play. Um, happy I said. Um, so that's uh, Probably, and, and myths like that, myths like that, they, they do resonate well. Because the image of Stalinist culture at the time would probably be as a, as a totally destructive force, which destroyed the Ukrainian culture. But what, what uh, and, and this is to a degree, it destroyed one car, kind of Ukrainian culture, but it immediately built another kind of Ukrainian culture. Uh, remember, for instance, that the most impressive monuments to Taras Shevchenko you would see in Ukraine today were built under Stalin at the height of the Great Terror in the late 1930s. And of course they were built in a very Stalinist style, kind of strangely monumental, uh, kind of misleadingly naturalistic, and sometimes with the kind of minor figures of the, the people there in the background. Uh, but nevertheless, the fact remains, you know, they were built under Stalin, because Stalin, under Stalinism, the cult of Shevchenko was alive and well. Uh, right? Uh, so, the irony is, of course, that we would have a monument to Shevchenko in Winnipeg, we would have monuments to Shevchenko in Ukraine, under Stalin too. So, this created a colossal tension for them, because then it becomes a matter of interpretation. Who is the Shevchenko we are building a monument here? And who is the Shevchenko they are building a monument there? Is it the same person? Right? And pretty much the same as Bandura players as well. So, people would assume. All Bandura players were killed because that makes sense. Because I think that the culture which remains there, essentially it was repressed. It was repressed, but it was repressed in a kind of symbolic sense, not in the actual physical one. Right? So, and I didn't mean to comment on the monument of Shachanko in Winnipeg, which I actually like. <laughs> uh, I have uh, four questions already. So, the basic fashion that I uh, raised in the laws, uh, I'm wondering if there should be a distinction between Kobzarin and Andreski. A Bandura player can be anybody who learns the instrument. The Kobzarin from the 30s, or the ones, uh, now Shostakovich writes about that too in his memoir. Did he make it up too? 
or did he get uh, information from someplace misleadingly? Oh, you mean the wandering ones, the ones who would go from, from place to place? Yeah, ah. those are the ones that were supposedly, uh, that you're saying it didn't happen, but those are the ones, the Bozari, who were called to this Congress and eliminated, which somebody, you know, I think wrote it down. But the, um, and the Bozari were not just players, they symbolize something and they symbolize, you know, Kobzad, Kobzadstvo, Ukrainian identity, this and that. The guys who came to rescue play, to play a country, to play entertainment, were just, they could have been fiddle players, but they played Bandura. So I think there has to be the distinction and is there no documentation at all about the Congress and execution? Nothing at all, ever? I'm sorry. No. There was never such a congress. Uh -huh. um, uh, the historian from the University of Indiana, um, by the name of Hiroaki Kurone, investigated this issue. And I read also something in Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, you made very good points. Um, indeed, because it's a new Ukrainian culture, a Stalinist one, which is created from the components, from the element of the old one, too. And what adds to the picture is that, of course, in the 1930s, all this. Uh, um, how do you put it? Uh, people with uh, nomadic lifestyles such as the gypsies in Ukraine, uh, people with no residential registration, individual peasants, whoever does not belong to some kind of well-defined place of residence and war, they are over-secured, really, because the Stalinist regime doesn't like people wandering around, whatever ideas they might you know, represent, in fact, and that's a good point. But, uh, but it's going on all around the place because, of course, when you have collectivization in the countryside and the famine in the countryside and the impressive police presence in the cities and you can't really make living in the city without an official permit, the resident, uh, a registration stamp and passports are being introduced, internal passports in 1932, that pretty much means that the police is rounding up whoever appears to be wandering around this whatever agenda. And that would be tens of thousands of people also numbers. Um, and one interesting thing I saw, I didn't actually research it, but uh, kind of saw accidentally a document. The majority of them are children, actually. So, because it's still after the 1920s and during the famine, the colossal numbers of children leaving the countryside and going to the cities, and they are the principal victims of this uh, legislation. But of course, I can, I can imagine that if there existed any considerable number, uh, but that's, that's an industrial society too. People escaping from the countryside, trying to find a job in the factory, otherwise they get decolocized, send to Siberia. So it's a context in which it is difficult to be a nomadic gypsy. The context in which it is difficult to be a wandering musician. Because you are bound to attract an official attention, official attention, police attention, essentially. And no matter whether there is an official directive or Congress or whichever, but the local police is going to be after you anyway. Right? So they're going to get you this way or the other. But this is quite right. Actually, it isn't just the college's memoirs. Now, it may actually be the source uh, for many people of that story. It's just the college goes on about that. I should also mention that in Shevchenko's poetry, in one of his best known poems, uh, that was written by Noah, I think, uh, there is a discussion about degenerate Kobzars. Kobzars who don't really know the history, don't know, really know the tradition, who strum along and basically only say what the, the, the post Minsky regime, the Tsarist regime wants them to say. So this is a long tradition. And it actually fits with what the Sunni was saying. Not all Kobzars know what they're talking about. Not all aspects of Ukrainian culture are authentic and so on. But you say? Well, I don't know much about Ivanko 
Kozlowski, except that he is a famous operatic tenor and one of the two big stars of the Bolshoi theater under Stalin. Um, he is from Ukraine, quite obviously. He started his academic, but his singing career in Ukraine in the 1920s, singing in Ukraine, actually continued singing in Ukraine and under Stalin, as far as I know. Um, you know, the leading operatic, one of the two leading operatic tenors in the country, that's a pretty enviable position, even under Stalin. So at this course of an area, a number of Stalin's prizes, awards, the order of Lenin, whichever this goes on. These people could have all kinds of connections, but it's even better, it makes them vulnerable. They would respond even better to uh, any kind of ideological complaining. And that, that's one thing about uh, the way Stalinist regime operated. They, were, they really liked the situation in which you have a brother who had been arrested, or a wife who had been arrested. Because makes you more agreeable to whatever ideological pressure there is. Um, Kozlovsky was friends with Miriam, by the way. They reported yeah, together after the war. Well, I wonder, too, whether the Franco lived miserably in Moscow in the 1940s. Whether this is another mythology. Well, I read his diaries. He says, I want to return to Ukraine, but I hate the people in the, the Franco studios and I don't want to go there ever. So I, I kind of like Ukraine as nature, as a mythical paradise, but work, he essentially he was pretty much squeezed out from the Dovrenko studio by, the, by internal infighting by the time he was denounced. Uh, so he couldn't go back as a filmmaker, so it, it's pretty much like Shevchenko, you know, Taras Shevchenko uh, says, oh, I want to go back to Ukraine, but you know, he went back and he got arrested immediately because he was chit-chatting on, on the ferry and said something which was reinterpreted as you know, blasphemy or whatever. So, so he wants, in a poetic sense, he wants to go back, in a poetic sense, right? So we take it as a stuff of the legend. But in the actual, I mean, that, they had a pretty impressive apartment on Kutuzovsky Prospect, as far as I know, which his widow sold in the early 1990s for, well, actually, uh, the person she adopted as her daughter sold for a nice sum of money. So. He was making films, he won the children, whatever. So whether he was miserable or not, mm, in a poetic sense, yes. But in reality, would he, would he have been happy at the Dovrenko Studios in the 1940s? The Dovrenko Studios in the 1940s is making films like uh, the heroic deed of a Soviet intelligence officer. Yeah. Uh, difficult to imagine Dovrenko in this climate, really. Uh, and that's the irony. That in, in, perhaps in Moscow he was unhappy in a poetic sense. But what is that? It is in Khrushchev's memoirs. But the question whether we believe Khrushchev or not. I haven't seen any documentary. Actually, Khrushchev claims twice in his memoir that he had saved Rilski from arrest by saying, well, you cannot arrest him. He wrote a great poem about Stalin. But everybody wrote great poems about Stalin pretty much by the late 1930s. So, um, the, the same story exists about the composer Philip Kozinski, allegedly about to be arrested, and somebody says, oh, wait a minute. He wrote this wonderful song about Stalin, the mountain eagle. You cannot possibly. Well, you can. But it's, it's, it's the stuff of the legend, which probably originates in, in, in the same period in the 1930s, I'm guessing. Because it fits nice into the Stalin myth, he can interfere. Okay, next question, Mr. Vishen. Yes, uh, my side completed the dissertation on the other side of Dovchenko at NYU. And uh, one of the schemes that he tried to show that Dovchenko was both a communist and a nationalist. Professors at NYU disagree with him. How strong is this in your structural, international structure throughout North America, where you have, you know, the nationalists, uh, 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 your team saying that there is nationalism and the populist can live together, you know. Uh, this was, I know I hold you without the quickness, and it was always the uh, I, I would strongly agree with the, with the argument that he was both communist and nationalist because it was possible in the 1920s. Then in the 1930s, 
Um, you have to make choices there. Either accept the aesthetic theory of socialist realism or not. And Dovzhenko was actually successful in adopting to it, very successful, like Ivan, Shores, and especially Ayer Ograd. And Ayer Ograd being so good that Stalin actually invites him into his office, Ayer Ograd is a film about um, a city in the Soviet Far East, like an, an imaginary fictional location in the Far East, where an airfield is located. And the Soviet Air Force is positioned there, and the bad enemies from across the border want to come, but they'll get caught and killed. <laughs> and a good Stalinist movie. So as Stalin was so impressed, he invited Dovzhenko to his office and said, Oh, can you show me on the map why you would position such an airfield? <laughs> and it opens up, the map is covered by some kind of curtain. It moves the curtain. Come here, Dovzhenko, come here, show me why I should put this airfield. I don't care. So it goes both ways, right? <laughs> the symbolic endorsement of the product by Stalin. I like it so much, I really want to build an airfield there and you know, attack somebody from the thing. Um, so Dovzhenko was actually a very successful uh, Stalinist filmmaker in the 1930s, which we should remember in Ivan about the construction of a DPS shorts in particular, that's kind of the paradigm of uh, Stalinist uh, filmmaking in Ukraine is shorts. The story of the Civil War, which requires totally mythical borders, has very little to do with reality. undecided, it will take them some time 
I'm confident that in the end they will arrive at the consensus. Um, I also doubt that um, you could describe the West as united on any of these issues. Perhaps you could have in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, these days, um, it's the same contestation and debate, really. And uh, especially with the recent move in what used to be Russian studies in the Western academia, and I, I take it that you will be asking about this, the predominance of Russian studies, the predominance of political history, the fact of the 1970s, most recent moves were towards studying the nationalities, most recently studying Central Asia, understanding Russia as colonial power, as all components of colonial identity. So it, I, I really honestly think that there is no united opinion on that. Uh, I also think that the debate is good in general, but of course uh, they operate, operate in mythologies very often, not the academia itself, but the political bodies. They have to, right? Because there's a political visit, um, and then there are statements made on this occasion, and then somebody protests the statements. But this is part of this is part of political struggle within Ukraine. This is part actually of what our you know Canadian government is doing as well. You know, on a visit to Ukraine, you have to say such and such things that this is the Ukrainian government which endorses such and such things and which would also give you support of uh, Ukrainian Canadians in the estimation of, of the government. Right? This is all underwritten by politics to a significant degree. In the academia, really, as of now, the 21st century, if a really split and open, open for debate, open for interpretation, especially now with the arrival of cultural history and linguistic term, uh, linguistic term and the understanding of uh, uh, it really mattered in what language it was expressed originally and rewritten afterwards and how you try to disentangle it by saying okay they labeled it this and then this term had a long life and then another term was introduced and here politics comes into place uh, and I'm you know I tend to be optimistic about this overall because it's becoming difficult to distinguish between the West and some other. I, I think I agree with you completely that things are changing now. Uh, I, I'm thinking back uh, in the Stalinist times that, that oh. you're talking about. And uh, for example, uh, when, uh, when, when my age people, when we went to school uh, and you saw a map of the world or you got a yeah. globe of the world, uh, Ukraine didn't exist in the globe. Uh, it was either Russia, usually it was Russia, sometimes it was the Soviet Union. Ukraine has only made it onto the globe, onto the maps that go into schools in, uh, I guess, probably since the independence. So I'm wondering why in those days, I think at that time, not, not that there was a universal acceptance, but, but uh, that seemed to be the view. That, that was the way they worded things. When Steinbach wrote his tour to uh, the Soviet Union, he called yeah. it his, his visits to Russia. I see, when, I see. And so on. Yeah, what, what I have to say is probably a nice, nice way to, to, to and uh, yeah, you are right, actually. Well, Russian studies did not really exist as such until after World War II. And that was the reason. And uh, I have to say that you are really lucky. I don't know if you realize how lucky you are here in Winnipeg, having one of the oldest Slavic, truly Slavic programs, where featuring Ukrainian studies. And I just came from you know, this text from the library where I was trying desperately to look up some stuff. Uh, an indication that there were always pockets of true Slavic studies, Ukrainian, Polish, whichever, whatever political or kind of real facts of societal facts determine that, such as the presence of the you know, Ukrainian Canadian community, influential politically and culturally. Um, but yes, it's probably World War II which really pushed the subject of Russian history, as it was called, to the top of academic agenda in North America. You can actually trace it the emergence of the first centers of Russian studies, which are now the centers of East Central European and Asian studies, were founded immediately after the conclusion of World War II. Uh, this is one academic careers of major big names who subsequently had academic schools. This is where they start. And this was always the case. I mean, my own university started the Russian program in 1959, and Sputnik is the key word to that. <laughs> You have to have, and the German program was started in 1943, and we also know what, what, what the reason was for that, too. In the middle of World War II, it's still Victoria College. So it is always determined by all kinds of considerations. But, uh, yeah, you are. I, mean, I, I agree with you. You're lucky, actually, here. I'm Vinicius. I'm Jules. I just add to that, you know, uh, 
Canada is an exception. Canada was one of the few places where Ukrainian studies existed. It did not exist anywhere else. The Ukrainian studies program was opened in England, the first one, two years ago, one year ago, uh, because money, money was provided from Ukraine. And so the conception of the concept of Ukraine's was this was all Russia. And in a state, and uh, Professor Lincoln is absolutely right, John Malkovich, who is of Ukrainian background, went uh, to a conference in Odessa, I think two years ago, and he was under the impression he was in Russia. And this is just so ingrained in people's heads. One of the uh, interesting things that is happening, and this is a, a very germane to what uh, Professor Yukelchik uh, is saying, is that the new material available in archives is mixing up a lot of people. It's mixing up uh, ideas, preconceptions, and myths. Uh, not only in the Soviet myths, but also myths in the West, and Athens myths. We have a whole different world now. And Dojenko's memoirs, so-called complete unabridged memoirs, were cut, abridged, and censored five times. And even the last edition, which claimed to be the full unabridged could not write certain things because he wrote about the persecution of Ukrainian nationalists, the Upa, in Western Ukraine. That piece was not even allowed, in, still is not being allowed to be published. So we're still sort of sifting through information, sifting through the myths. Anyway, I didn't want to talk, so <laughs> any, other, any other questions? If not, I'd like to uh, thank you all for participating and above all for thank you so much.